Hello and welcome to this week's two-minute EBP challenge, Blood Glucose and Mortality. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to be extraordinary. Join us online by going to www.edfornurses.com. As I mentioned, this is part of our two-minute EBP challenge. If you'd like to become part of this, every Friday you get a question in your email, and every Monday you get the response to that question, as the name implies, so that you can get evidence-based information in a very short period of time and help you to stay up to date. Well, what we're talking about today is we're talking about blood glucose and cells. So we're talking about what is the optimal blood glucose we want to have in our patients and how that's going to affect the patient primarily from the aspect of mortality. So we definitely don't want our patients to have more complications and a higher mortality rate as a result of mismanaging their blood glucose. So let's talk a little bit about blood glucose and what it does in the body, what it does to the cells of the body. First of all, it is the primary energy source for the body. So the primary energy source, all of the cells in the body need it now. Particularly, we're going to be concerned about the brain because the brain cannot live very long without having an adequate supply of blood glucose. And we'll come back to that. Secondly, Blood glucose is one of the components that maintains osmolality in the blood. Osmolality, you can also think of as being concentration. So many of us learned about osmolality back in nursing school, and we promptly forgot all about osmolality because we haven't used it since. But we do want to be aware of osmolality because blood glucose concentrations will change osmolality. It's one of the major contributors to osmolality or concentration in the blood. So we want to make sure that our blood glucose is in that normal range. Thirdly, glucose metabolites can damage blood vessels. This is what happens when our patients have hyperglycemia for a long period of time. So let's take a look at that first piece there with our glucose metabolism. Glucose is going to be metabolized through the body. It's absorbed in the gut. Then it's going to be stored in the skeletal muscle and in the liver. And then when we need more glucose, like during times of exercise and starvation, and really when we mean starvation, we just mean between meals. You know, we can absorb glucose almost immediately out of the bloodstream, the simple sugars, when we eat. But we need to have glucose available throughout the day. So you just had breakfast. Okay, now it's a couple hours later and you're using glucose still from that breakfast because it went into storage and you're pulling it back out for when you're going to need it. So obviously having an adequate amount of glucose is going to be important. Having too much though doesn't make this better. Sometimes there can be too much of a good thing and that's what can happen with glucose. Too much of a good thing and we're going to run into problems with hyperglycemia. So we can't put it all into storage. We can't dump it all out in the urine then it's going to start to become a problem in the bloodstream. By the way, we start dumping glucose out in the urine when the glucose concentration in the bloodstream reaches about 250 milligrams per deciliter, then it's going to start to be dumped by the kidneys. It's kind of, that's kind of like the top of the dam on the kidneys, and when it reaches 250, it starts spilling over the top of the dam, and we start losing glucose in the urine. The second component that I mentioned was osmolality. Now, osmolality, again, is concentration. And as the picture here implies, if we have the same number of glucose molecules in the tissue as we do in the vasculature, then we're going to have normal movement of fluid back and forth from the tissue to the vasculature. However, if we get into a situation where we have high osmolality, this would be a situation where the patient has hyperglycemia. Then there's going to be a pulling of fluid out of the tissues and into the vasculature. Where this is especially going to be a problem, I mean, it wouldn't matter so much that we're dehydrating the tissues of the forearm, for example, but where it's really a problem is the tissue of the brain. We don't want to be dehydrating the tissues in the brain. Now, the brain cells themselves are not going to become dehydrated. They're going to start bringing in protein molecules in order to be able to maintain fluid balance. However, this is going to set up the situation where a patient can develop cerebral edema, and we don't want that to happen. 
Hyperglycemia can also cause long-term disability, long-term complications and damage. It's occurring from the patient having hyperglycemia. And we have macrovascular type of events that are occurring. This is the result of damage to the inside of the blood vessels from those glucose metabolites. Microvascular damage occurring both from the fact of the macrovascular decreasing blood flow to those small vessels and ischemia that is also occurring at that vascular level. In addition, we're also going to have damage to our nerves. Now, initially, we used to think that most of this damage just came from the high glucose. We're starting to realize, or we're starting to consider the possibility that some of this damage also comes from hypoxia. Okay, we have that macrovascular event occurring. It's causing decreased blood flow. It's causing decreased in the lumen size of that vessel that's feeding that nerve. And now the nerves don't get as much blood as they're supposed to. They become ischemic, and we get nerve damage. One thing we do know is that the higher that blood glucose goes, the higher the chance there is of long-term complications associated with it. So we do want to have the lowest possible blood glucose we can have without causing the opposite complication, which is hypoglycemia. So what is ideal? Well, ideal might be having a tight blood glucose concentration between 70 and 110. Okay, now that would be ideal that we have this tight blood glucose concentration. However, in our patients in the hospital, what happens when we go for that ideal tight kind of control is we overshoot the mark and we put too many people into hypoglycemia. Also a bad deal. Okay, hypoglycemia, remember the brain cannot tolerate being without oxygen and without glucose. Okay, so that's not going to be a good deal. We can't go without getting enough glucose to the brain. The patient's going to have brain damage, possibly even death. So that's not going to be the way we want to go. Now, the American Diabetes Association is now recommending, rather than going for this tight control, which could lead to overtreatment and hypoglycemia, they're recommending a target blood glucose of 140. A target one glucose of 140 is going to put us more in the range of having decent blood glucose without overshooting the mark and getting into hypoglycemia. It's almost better to have hyperglycemia, but there's a lot of complications associated with hyperglycemia. Those include things like increased intracranial pressure, more complications, higher morbidity and mortality in our patients. So we don't want to have hyper. On the other hand, we don't want to have hypo because that can cause death to our patient in a very short period of time. We also don't want to have a lot of movement in our glucose, a lot of variability in our glucose, where it's going high and low and high and low. You, you've seen that before. We're chasing the glucose all day long. We're 300, we're 50, we're 300, we're 50. Okay, that's going to be just as dangerous to the patient, and mortality and morbidity is just as high as if the patient had hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. So what we're trying to accomplish with our patient is we're trying to get to the point of euglycemia, where the patient has a fairly normal blood glucose, and now the American Diabetes Association is recommending that that be 140. Here's a good website to send your patients and their families to, the American Diabetes Association. A lot of great resources available here for us so that we can learn more about diabetes, but also for your patients. Lots of great patient teaching resources. This would be a good website to send your patients and their families to. It's diabetes.org. Well, he says, you know, it really wasn't insulin. You don't have diabetes yet. It was just a warning shot, okay? Well, we don't want to be giving people warning shots or giving them too much insulin because hypoglycemia is just as dangerous as hyperglycemia is in our patients in a hospital. If you'd like to find out more about this particular article, Dr. Badawi and Associates, in the uh, Critical Care Medicine Journal, you can look for Association Between Intensive Care Unit Acquired Disc glycemia and in-hospital mortality. It's in the newest edition of Critical Care Medicine. Well, thank you for joining me this week for Blood Glucose and Mortality, part of our two-minute EVP challenge. Join me online by going to www.edfornurses.com. Thanks again for joining me this week. Until next time, bye now.